Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me on the podcast today, all the way from Israel, is Jack Cohen. He is the author of the book, Life on Planet All. So thanks for joining me, Jack. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to talk about Jack and his wife and some definite caregiver tips, but we're also going to have a little bit on the difference between caring for a loved one in the United States versus Israel. So why don't you start off by telling the story of you and your wife, wherever you would like to start is fine. Okay. Well, we we were both born in in England, in London. We grew up in London. Um, uh, I actually came from the east end of London, which is like equivalent to the east side of New York which was a sort of very Jewish area when I was a child. And um, we we met teenagers, basically, and uh, we got married pretty young. I I went to uh, Queen Mary College in University of London, which was fairly close to where I lived. And then I did a PhD in Cambridge. We went to Cambridge. We had a wonderful time in Cambridge. I was uh, I did my PhD there in chemistry uh, with a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Lou Todd, and it was an, a, a fantastic experience. You know, a really life authorizing sort of experience. And um, then after that, I got a grant from the Science Research Council, a fellowship from the Science Research Council of the UK. And I chose to come to the Weizmann Institute in Israel. So when we would, we had our first child, she was like a month or two months old, and we flew to Israel. It was our first flight in 1964. Hmm. And we came to Israel and spent two years in Israel. And that was also, uh, you know, such an experience that we always wanted to come back. So at the time, it was sort of impossible to get, any sort of positions in Israel because it was it was like a small agrarian country then, you know, in, in the sixties. And so we we left, and I got a I got a job as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School. And, I've heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you know my wife was with me all the time, and we had a wonderful life. Uh, we had a second child. He was born in London on en route to to the States. He now lives in California and my daughter lives here. And actually she's living in the house with me and her husband and daughter here at the moment because their house is undergoing renovations. It's just up the street. So uh, then we, we came back to Israel in, I, I worked at the National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute for 22 years. And then I was a professor at Georgetown Medical School for five years I think it was and then we decided since our children were grown up and had left the nest and my wife didn't like the the weather in the winter in Washington uh, we decided to move and it was a sort of choice between California or Israel and since uh, my daughter had already had two children here so my wife wanted to be with the grandchildren understandably so we came here and also, we, we had a commitment, you know, we, we, we had lived here before, and we were Zionists in a sense. We, we supported Israel strongly. So we came here, and we fitted in. It, it was relatively easy. Having lived here for two years when we were younger, you know, it was pretty easy to, to uh, adapt. And, and uh, my wife spoke some Hebrew. I spoke some Hebrew. So, you know, we, we fitted in. And we lived... Uh, we moved actually into a place called Netanya. It's a very nice seaside resort just north of Tel Aviv. Beautiful little town. And we, we lived there, and I worked at the at Tel Ashomer Hospital, uh, which is the Sheba Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in Israel. It's a government-run hospital. And I was the chief scientist there, and we had a very nice time. Uh, and everything was hunky-dory, as you say, until... Uh, around 2011, um, 2010, before that, my wife started showing 
indications of something being wrong. She, she would forget things. She would do strange things and she would not remember things and so on. And it got to be, came to a point where we, we went to, we were referred to the psychogeriatric center at Ichilov Hospital in Tel Aviv, which is very nice. It's a, they give you free, free um, um, uh, diagnosis. They, 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 they do testing, they ask questions, they very professional, and then they give you a diagnosis. And that they diagnosed that Nami was, had uh, Alzheimer's. And um, so from then on, it was a question of sort of facing the fact and dealing with it. And, uh, you know, then many things happened. You know, there were many incidents and things that I, I wrote about in my book. Is is my actual book, Life on Planet Owls, which is available, by the way, on Amazon. And it tells the story of how I dealt with it. And, and the title actually comes from a discussion we had. So I joined a caregiver's group at our English-speaking club. In, in Israel, there's an English-speaking club all over the country called the Association of Americans and Canadians in Israel. And in Netanya, there's a particularly big, active club, and they had a caregiver's group meeting once, once every two weeks. So I joined it. And it was a very good environment for me, very good exchange of people felt very much that they could release their feelings. Sometimes they cried, sometimes they laughed, but you know, it was, it was very good. And um, during th those discussions, I, I, I happened to say, it seems like we're on a different planet, that can... we are living in a, a, like a different, a bubble, a different planet from everybody else. And nobody really quite understands what we're, experiencing and and we can't really relate to other people because we this is all all consuming for us that is very true so that's how i came to to write that book now as a scientist and a medical person what how did you react to the diagnosis well i'm not a medical person in in the sense i'm, I'm not a, an md i'm a phd and so i'm a, a medic biomedical researcher and, you know, at first I reacted, I think a lot of people do, before the, before the actual diagnosis, I reacted kind of angrily because I thought my wife was doing things which were kind of stupid. You know, why would you keep buying toilet rolls? I mean, I know in corona, coronavirus times they're, they're scarce, but she would come home with a, a, a big contempt, bag a, a, a package of toilet rolls every time she went shopping until we had 12 of them on our balcony and I said don't buy any more and sure enough the next time she went shopping she would do somehow in her head she had the idea that we needed toilet rolls and even if she wrote a list I said write a list so she wrote a list and then she would either forget the list or she would take it with her and forget to look at it or even if she looked at it, she would still buy toilet rolls. <laughs> I've, I've read recently why people are quote unquote hoarding toilet paper during yes. this pandemic. And it's part of it is it's like this feeling of needing to be clean and cared for. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like a subconscious psychological need for yeah. cleanliness. And I'm wondering yeah. if, if with her mind not being the way it, we think it should be, should be yeah. um, which is not really the better term. Right. I'm wondering if, if there was such, like she knew something was wrong and that was like its manifestation of, of showing that something was wrong. Cause I, I read that on your notes. And I was like, that's funny because that's what people are yeah. doing now. Yeah. Yeah. And I laugh because my friends buy toilet paper every time it's on sale. So they had plenty when this whole thing started. Yeah. <laughs> But it's true that she was hoarding it, but she didn't remember that she was hoarding it. So she would each time buy another package, you know. And it wasn't just toilet paper. We had, I, I remember finding eight open jars of jam or um, what do you call it? Uh, conf, no, uh, 
what, what do you call jam? You know, um, jam or jelly. Uh, what? No, no, jelly, kind of jelly. Yeah. You, jam America. has got pieces of fruit in it, and jelly is smooth. Oh, I see. That's the difference. Well, mostly jam. We 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 had eight open jars of jam in our refrigerator. All the same flavor? No, different, different. <laughs> but they were all, you know, sort of there, and they were taking up space. And I said, you know, don't open any more. And and she would keep bringing new ones and opening new ones. You know, so this this these were the kind of manifestations when I realized that she had some serious problem. And then the, the, the next thing was that she couldn't cook. She lost the ability to remember how to cook. And so she would make a dinner, let's say she would put something on a plate and put it in the microwave and randomly you know, dial in numbers. She didn't remember. So one day she dialed, she put in, uh, she she put um, a meal in there for 12 minutes and when it came out it was like hard leather you know and I you know I got angry like you know sometimes men get angry you know and I said why are you doing this you know it's you're wasting the food I can't eat this you know and then the realization dawned that I was the one who was being stupid because she couldn't remember you know I said you know you should put it in for one minute or two minutes or even up to four minutes, but 12 minutes is going to destroy it. But she just couldn't remember. Well, it's interesting because like, as my mom progressed, my dad was a horrible cook. Yeah. And I think he tried to allow her to make meals as long as possible because he was really bad at it. <laughs> yeah, but well, I it, was the same. Yeah. It got to the point where it was like, in, and this is not uncommon, especially for seniors that are living alone or just pairs and maybe they don't have family close by. But when you think about the number of steps just to make a sandwich, yeah. you got to get all the stuff out of the fridge and then you got to <laughs> assemble it and, you know, cut it. And it's a lot of steps and it's like, exactly. It's, and I think cooking is one of the things that goes quickly because it's, it's not complicated. Well, I mean, you can do complicated stuff, but even basic recipes yeah. are multiples of steps and you have to time the steps and, you yeah. know, it's not just a, I mean, although throwing something in the microwave is pretty easy, <laughs> yeah. but as you but learned, not so it's easy. True. It's true that everything that requires steps, she couldn't do. Like, for example, if you, you think of, um, of, of putting on your clothes in the morning, you have to go through certain steps. You have a shower, you wipe yourself. You couldn't remember which steps to do, you know she would forget to wipe herself. She mm. would forget, she would refuse to have a shower. She would put things on backwards or upside down or inside out, really just completely randomly. And sometimes she would put on five sets of underwear, you know, and, and two or three is completely random. And so I had to, so some years, a couple of years after she was first diagnosed, in the Israeli system, um, what happens is you apply for a foreign caregiver because most of the Israelis don't do that job. The foreigners, you know, and usually Filipinos or Indians are the usual ones. And so um, you have to you you have to be um, tested or, or vetted by the Ministry of Health, and they decide whether you should have could ha uh, whether you justify having one. And then there's um, a nurse from the municipality that comes and checks you every few months. And if they decide that you need help, then they will uh, recommend that you get it. And then they will give you a certain number of hours. And so the hours that you can have somebody for is then you can apply for somebody and they bring them usually either somebody who's already in Israel or somebody they bring in. In our case, they brought in uh, somebody. And uh, she was a Filipina, very, very nice girl. And she lived with us. Uh, this was like a few years after she was diagnosed first, by the time it had got really serious. But she, uh, because Naomi, my wife, Naomi, I should have mentioned her name, she didn't want to, she d wouldn't allow this, this um, caregiver to help her with intimate things like 
undressing and dressing and things like that. She would not let her. So I had to do that. So it defeated the purpose to some extent. On the other hand, you know, since I, I, I hated cooking and I couldn't cook, the, this, this girl did all the cooking and looked after us and did all the, she looked after my wife's medication and all that kind of thing. And eventually after a year or two, they gave us the maximum number of hours, which is 18 hours, which means basically 24 seven, um, that they can live in the house in, in with you with, for 24, uh, 24 seven. And they, they're required to be given like two hours every night off at least, and, and one, one day a week. Which is off, reasonable. It's usually, usually Saturday. And, um, and, and so, you know, and, and she, she lived with us for, I think, five years. And she helped, helped us a tremendous amount. But I had to bear the brunt of looking after my wife in detail, like in everyday things. Um, my daughter used to come up once a week, uh, to spend a day with us so you know she would help and she would help help her mother to remember her you know and they used to go out and walk around and do shopping and and the 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 carer the filipino carer whose name was sally she also would take my wife around to the stores and to shopping and so on and you know so we kept her occupied and it worked pretty well for I would say about five years we were in that sort of situation. And then it sort of got worse. And so then we decided, uh, I retired, and we moved down here to Beersheba in the south. From the, We were living in the Tanya north of Tel Aviv. We moved down here. It's two hours drive. It's not that far. And my daughter, the reason we moved down here is because my daughter is here with her husband. Her husband works at the Ben-Gurion University, which is in Beersheba. So, so we came down here and we th I thought this would be, you know, a much better situation because my daughter could help me as well as the caregiver being here. But uh, after a few months, we realized it was getting worse. And then after eight months, we came to the tipping point. I came to the tipping point and my, luckily in a way, my daughter was here because she could agree with me that we got to the point where we had to institutionalized my wife we had to put her in a home and she is in a home with a locked Alzheimer's ward and um, at the moment because of the coronavirus I can't visit her but I was visiting her every day for for like a year and a half until the coronavirus started and um, but the nurses there are very nice and they do uh, con contact us on smartphone and we see my wife and we talk to her but she doesn't she doesn't really understand it. You know, she sees us. Sometimes she says hello, but she doesn't understand whether, you know, she can't comprehend whether we're there or not. You know, I don't think she fully understands what this phenomenon is. So that, been, that's the sort of situation. Yeah. I, well, you, so the tipping point was because she was getting combative, right? Yes, very aggressive, yes. Yeah, my mom got the same way. And I think with the smartphones, because yes. I have, my mom always loved dogs. That was one of her stories. I've had dogs all my life, blah, blah, blah. And I would show her, I would try to show her cute pictures or little videos of my dogs on my phone, and it didn't register. And yeah. so I've been suggesting to the care homes that I'm, that I deal with my moms and others that mm -hmm. they use smart TVs so that when the, you know, your wife or my mom is, are looking at us, we're more like life size. Cause my mom's visual processing was shot. And yeah, that, that's a very good point. I, I, I think that's a good, I, I may say home too. I think that's a very good idea. Even a, a larger they, iPad they, would they, help. Yeah. They don't register that you're, a person there, you know. Anyway, so what happened was that she got very aggressive. And there were times when, uh, of course, when we were in Natanya, there were times, a few times when she got lost. And we didn't know where she was. And we were frantically running around and calling the police and so on. One time, I don't, I don't know how she got there, but she got to a school. And outside, there was a group of girls who were getting ready to go home. And so they, she asked them, you know, she did, 
obviously they realized she was completely lost. So they took her in a, in a, in a cab, a taxi to our house. Oh, that's good. Luckily she remembered where it was. Oh, she, or did she have, she had a wrist, uh, a name, a name tag on her wrist by then. I'm not sure, but I, I had to get that for her. Yeah, and that's... another time she, she walked in the wrong direction and she was like a mile down the road in the wrong direction. And I, I stayed home. We called the police. The police said, stay home. And the, the carer went out looking for her and she kept walking in the wrong direction and she found her eventually. So, There's... you know, these things happen. But then when we were down here and also before that, she had this thing a lot of people do about, I want to go home. And we would say, you are home already. No, this is not my home. It looks like my home, but it's not my home. And she would go to the door and she would bang on the door and kick the door. Oh. You know, and, and it was so difficult. And so uh, we took to just taking her out for a walk, walking around the block, coming back, and she would accept it. Yeah, I never had to deal with that with my mom, thankfully. And yeah. she lived in her home for two months shy of 47 years. So I was terrified that she would you know i i want to go home i want to go home which is very common because yeah. when we moved her to the memory care mm -hmm. she it was so funny the day before she said i was telling her well we're just gonna it's just temporary which was sort of true and yeah. <laughs> i said because there's some things that need to be fixed up in your house and so we're gonna do that but we, you they had a um it looked like this roof had leaked and there was a big stain on the ceiling. And so I said, see, it was, it was large. I'm pretty sure she could make it out at that point. And so I kept telling her, it's just, it's just temporary. No, we're, well, you're not selling my house. No, we're not going to sell your house. And the day before we moved her in, she looked at me, complete clarity on her face. And she goes, and you're not renting it out either. And I was like, Oh, whoopsies. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very concerned that she would not acclimate to the new living environment, yeah. which it did take about six to eight weeks, which was rough. But one yeah. of the things I've learned is when people are at home and they're saying, I want to go home, I want to go home. They very well may be looking for a feeling of safety and comfort and the thing you would probably get when you go home like if we've been traveling maybe a week, yeah, two weeks, yeah. and it's like, oh man, I can't wait to get home and have my own couch, my own bed. You know, even though I'm you're pretty, loving where you're traveling, there's I'm still that sure. feeling. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she was talking about her home when she was a child. That's pretty common too. Because I think she was thinking of her home and her original home. And one of the funny things was when we moved here, this is, we were in an apartment in Natanya here. We are in a, a one uh, level sort of you might call it a bungalow or a, I'm not sure it's a joined along the street I'm not sure what you call it uh, you know it's con connected a whole series of them uh, along a lane there's no cars here it's just a lane and um, and there's no upstairs here and she would go around looking for the stairs and she would go around back, literally banging on the wall to see where are the stairs. And, you know, it was, it was so weird. And, you know, unfortunately, then the tipping point for me was one day she had a shower and I was trying to get her to, um, to, to, get, to get dressed and to get dry and get ready. And she got very angry with me and she picked up the, the wet a uh, diaper that she'd been using, the pull-up diaper that she'd been using, which was wet from you, you know what, and she hit me around the face with it, oh, and she ran screaming into the living room, oh, naked, shouting, call the police, call the police. And I said, at this point, I can't take this, I can't deal with it anymore, you know, I cannot control her, I cannot help her, you know, there's nothing I can do, you know, she's just out of control. And so my wife, my daughter and I discussed it and we agreed. And then luckily we found this very nice small, which is only five minutes drive from here. And we were very fortunate. We found it and they took her in there and she's been there for two years now. Now do they, where she's at, do they do activities and? Oh that? yes. Okay. Oh, yes. So they have a person in charge of activities and, uh, 
every morning they do some sort of physical activity. They sit them all in a big circle and they kick a ball, a big yellow ball around, you know, and then they, they have um, drawing. Some of them people do very good draw, you know, not so much drawing, uh, pages with a picture on which you fill in. Right, coloring. Mm -hmm. Coloring, exactly. And my wife doesn't, isn't able to do that, but she, what she does, she, uh, my daughter-in-law made a worry blanket for her, which she's got used to, which she likes to play with and feel, you know. And then um, she has books in English, which we take, uh, basically children's uh, nursery rhymes. And she looks at the nursery rhymes and she likes animals and she looks at the animals, you know. I bought her a book, uh, or somebody bought her a book uh, full of photographs of animals. And, you know, you turn the page and there are lions and there are seals and ba all, all baby animals. And, and, you know, she every morning I would give that to her and she would look at it, you know, and she would go through it. And I, I'm not sure how much she really understood, but she, she seemed to like it. And There's we would read her nursery rhymes and things like that. There's some books you might want to check out. They are available on Amazon. They're called Two Lap Books. They are designed for people with cognitive impairment. They're, oh, that's interesting. They're, they're not a story. They're um, about 14 by 11 inches. I'm a photographer, so that's, a, that's, that's my, my measurement is photographs. And each page is very brightly illustrated with... Sounds very good. Yeah, they're great. There's three of them. I have two and my mom actually really enjoyed them. And when I brought them to her, you know, in her residence, she yeah. had a friend who always carted around a paperback and I never knew for sure if this other Diane, my mom's name was Diane and she befriended another woman named Diane, which was super confusing for my mother. And then for a while there were three Diane. <laughs> so we had oh Diane, other Diane and other, other Diane. <laughs> Just because it was, you know, my I would say, oh, where's where's your friend Diane? And she, my mom would say, I'm Diane. I'm like, I know the other one. <laughs> it was just, it was confusing. <laughs> Very confusing. So yeah. she she actually could still process language by reading. Yeah. And yeah. in the beginning of the book, it talks about how to use the book. And so she's reading the book. <laughs> she's reading the how to the read. It's so yeah. funny. Um. I'll try to remember. To, I'll email you the link to that. Well, that I, I appreciate show. it because my son is always asking me, what shall I bring or what shall I send? You know, so that would be ideal because he's happy to get those books and send them to me. I would very much like Yeah, they're, I love them. I would show yeah. them to you, but I think they're Oh, downstairs. sorry, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. But it's good to know because it's difficult to find the right kind of book because if it's got too much writing in it, she... She can read English still, but she sort of peters out. She loses sort of interest because she doesn't understand. She can't get the meaning of the whole thing together. So she sort of loses interest. But as long as it's got some writing and lots of pictures, she's happy. Yeah, I think it's and, basic uh, sentences like there's an older woman sitting in a chair in the sunshine. And I think the one, I think there's only one sentence or maybe two maximum per page. And it'll say something good. like, I love I love to sit in the sun with the sunshine on my face or something. It's really basic, but because it's brightly colored and there's a lot of contrast in the colors, it's it's easy for them to process visually. That's exactly yeah. And um, you know, there's pictures of like little kids holding grandma's hand. So it's like my mom. I, I don't know why I never thought of baby animal books. That was it's like. Well, I'm still learning things, even though now I can't do right. them with her. Um, yeah. But she was very resistant to anything that was childlike. So I'm not sure oh. children's books would have been helpful, although that's a good thing to try. My mom liked yeah. to be yeah. a helper, which was yeah. frustrating. I was, I'd was i spent months trying to figure out how to allow the, the residence she was in to let her quote unquote help so that she was less combative, but not make more work for them. And uh, I never did. I did not find that solution before mom no, passed that's away. Difficult. That's difficult. But the, one of the main things that I did for my wife while she's in the home is music. We bought her earphones with 
like 500 songs on them and you know and, and on, on a small uh, disc mm -hmm. and um and and you know whenever i went there i would put these on her before i left and turn on the music and she would at first she would say take those off take those off but then once she heard the music she would and then she would start singing along she used to sing in a choir she had a very nice soprano voice and she used to, for years she sang in a choir in our in our area in uh, outside washington in, in bethesda maryland and um so she would sing along with these this music and so everybody's doing their own thing coloring and so on and she's singing along you know completely oblivious of what's going on around her and she 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 directs so she's singing along and doing this you know <laughs> Uh, it's quite funny in a way, but you know, it keeps her occupied and she enjoys it. Yeah, my mom was always into talk radio. I think if she oh. was one still alive and had her wits about her, I think she'd actually really enjoy podcasts. And I did play her mine occasionally, but yeah. I never used headphones, which is definitely better because it, it kind of puts it right into your brain. There's less distraction. So yes, less distraction, yeah. if your loved one doesn't respond to music, like my mom, my dad would listen to music at home, but mom would have a talk, you know, a daytime TV talk show on in the back of the house and on each end of the house, essentially. So as she went about her chores, she would hear the talking. And then she also listened, like if she was sitting in a room doing something, sewing or working on some of my dad's business, she would listen to talk radio. So I know she would like podcasts, but I never could figure out how to play podcasts for her that, you know, I should have played mine as I was leaving. That, was, that would have been a really good suggestion. Sam, I'll the problem is that if it's something that you have to follow over a period of time, then my wife just loses the, the meaning of it. She loses the, 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 the connection. Mm -hmm. and, and then it sort of just becomes gibberish. That's I'm just wondering if the, the if hearing my voice would have been soothing. That might be true. That would be true, I think, yeah. Well, hearing something for somebody else to try, I suppose. <laughs> but the, one of the problems is my wife recognizes me and my daughter and my son because we're in constant, we were in constant contact with her. But she doesn't really know who we are. You know, she she doesn't connect her children as they are adults to the children she had. Mm -hmm. And she would often ask me, Jack, where are the children? You know, and I would say, well, they're grown up and they live somewhere else by themselves now. And she would say, oh, you know, she really didn't quite comprehend. And then on several occasions, she asked me, strange thing, she asked me, how many children did I have? She didn't remember. And she asked me, you know, she said to me one day uh, when I was visiting her, she said, we should get married. Well, at least she, <laughs> at least she picked you a second time. <laughs> My mom always thought I was her best friend. And I, I was kind of lucky because over the course of about three years, I lost 100 pounds. So I was fairly certain that she did not recognize me because I was overweight for 20-ish years. Yeah. And that was during the beginning in the middle of her disease. Yeah. So as she got into the later stages, the person that I am was not the person that she remembered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was always her best friend and she'd tell everybody, Oh, I've known her for, for a really long time. And I would laugh and say, Oh yeah, you think like maybe 53 years. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> and yeah. it, so she, and she knew and she trusted me. So this whole not being able to visit is really difficult for everybody. Um, I only had to deal with it for two weeks and I was beginning to get to the point where I was about to just say, you know, I have been locked in my house. I have not seen anybody or gone anything. I am coming over there because I was concerned my mom would forget who I was completely and then not oh. trust me. And then we'd have even more issues, but mom fixed that for all of us. Yeah. And then there was something else I was going to say, Oh yes. Right before Thanksgiving, 2019 i was taking her to my house um to pick up her winter clothes and i know people laugh because you know we're in california so you really don't need those right <laughs> and, mm. and i had i had separated her closet even though it was small and she didn't have a ton of clothes i separated her clothing into like warmer weather and cooler weather so that yeah. there was less choices because 
in 2018, every day, every Monday when I'd go and visit, she had the same sweater on. And I finally got to the point where I asked the staff, is she giving you a hard time about changing clothes? And then they, one day they said, oh yeah, and showering too. And I'm like, oh, that explains some other things. <laughs> so I took like half of her clothes out and they had a lot less issues with that. But we were driving to my house and I'm asking her, what would you like to do for Thanksgiving? And she kept saying, well, you know, whatever Chuck wants to do, my husband wants to do, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, what do you want to do? Well, I need to talk to her. No, what do you want to do? And I finally said, do you want to spend time with your daughters? I don't have daughters. Like, oh okay, God. thanks a lot. <laughs> Fortunately, oh. I was used to it, but she remembered her brothers. She's the oldest of four. And so it's her, the two brothers, and her sister. And unfortunately, she didn't remember her sister either. I don't know why she always remembered the guys. But it was just funny that she True. eventually lost the, I had sons, not daughters. That was weird. That was a really weird conversation. <laughs> yeah. Things do sometimes get very weird. Yeah. yeah, they get all mixed up. And and closer to the end, and this is the one thing that I've realized since mom passed away, is that you're so, even though she was in a care home and I would go once a week and then spend the rest of the week trying to figure out how to solve some of the challenges she kept presenting all of us. She, you know, it was like, I lost that train of thought. I hate that when it happens. Um, oh, fudge. You were, about, <laughs> you were talking about your mother when she, she was in the home and you... Right. She, and she was she remembered her sons but not her daughters. Yes, that train of thought's really just gonna just stick in the back of my head because I could feel it trying to pop out. <laughs> One second, <laughs> let me think for a second. I'm gonna have to edit out this section. <laughs> I swear, <laughs> I don't have Alzheimer's. It's a little early for me still. Yeah. Um. So we were. Ooh. Oh, crumbing. <laughs> oh well. What Never am I? mind. Let's just press on. Yeah, we'll just keep going. So do you have advice for people? Oh, I remember now. I love it when you stop trying really hard to remember. Okay. When you're in the midst of taking care of somebody, it's like you cannot see the forest for the tree. You're just so focused on them that it's very hard to see the rest of reality. Cause my husband kept saying, yeah. You know, because I kept saying, I think mom's got two or three more years. Now, this was the very beginning of 2020. My mom passed away on March 31st. So I kept saying, eh, I think mom's got two or three more years, which she might have if she hadn't broken her leg. But my husband kept saying, I don't think so. She seems really worse than I think you're acknowledging. And I think that's one of the challenges is it's like you really don't have a clue how bad it really is until you can take a giant step back. And that's coming from me, who she was in, like I said, she was in a care home. So yeah. it's, it's really, really hard because she started hallucinating. And I suspected yeah. that. And that was like in February. Mm -hmm. And it was just. Well, I, always, I always said that, uh, you know, putting somebody in a home is the last, the final step. You know, I, I would never do that unless I was absolutely forced to. But then, and as I said in my little write-up that I did here, that you have to learn to accept when the tipping point comes. You know, you have to be open to the, 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 the probability that at some point you're not going to be able to deal with this yourself and that you need professional people to do it. And, you know, let's face it, in the home, she has nurses, attendants available as a doctor on site, you know, um, not all the time, but most of the time, you know, and, and the nurses are very, very um, sympathetic, you know, they, they deal with them, they, they're very friendly to the, to the patient. So, you know, I think that that's very good. And, and she seems to have lost most of her aggressiveness now. She still is aggressive at times. She will refuse to do things and so on. But, you know, I think she's much better off there than she was. Deal with it. It's interesting because you were saying how the nurses are so patient and stuff. And my mom drew blood on people. She would scratch yes, and they draw cut blood. Their nails. In, in the place where my wife is, they cut their nails regularly oh, and, so and also do their hair and keep it very short. <laughs> So that's, that's one thing that's really different is because of the potential for cutting the nails and maybe cutting the skin and getting an infection, 
they yeah. don't do that. Now they did trim my mom's nails once, but I don't think that technically that was allowed. And I carried really? nail clippers in my purse because I swear yeah. you'd think I just did that and they'd be, you know, half an inch long. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, because she was also attached to an assisted living community, there was a, a salon gal there and she was great. She would go the memory care, pick the gals up, go and do their hair and all that great stuff. Yeah. Well, it got to the That's point where my mom's like, I'm not going with you. Or she went the last time yeah. she went without me, the gal texted me and said, mom's not willing to go. And we'd already gone through mom didn't go the day before, but it, I, we foolishly made the appointment at lunchtime. So I thought it was after lunch, but there was no flexibility yeah. on the timing. Yeah. So when lunch was a little late, it screwed everything up. So the That's next day, yeah. yeah. So the next day she went down to get mom and mom didn't want to go. And then she convinced mom to go. And then mom said, no, you're not going to, you're not doing anything to my hair. You're not doing anything. To my hair. There was a series of text messages back and forth. It was so frustrating. She, she finally got everything handled, hair trimmed, washed and, cut and everything and after that i was like i i can't have this nonsense i mean this woman basically had two appointments for you and got paid for one this is not this is not okay so it would be nice if the other thing that i don't understand and i don't know if it's just california or the united states in general but i don't know why these communities don't have doctors on on staff or on call because man taking my mom to the doctor was the worst headache for the last year yeah, the doctor yeah. was a pain in the rump she was a pain in the rump i was like i don't need yeah. this <laughs> yeah we had a serious problem with my wife's teeth she needed a, mi a minor operation on her teeth and we took her refused absolutely to let him look and and so on so he recommended there's uh, the 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 um ear, nose, and throat and at the local big hospital, they, um, they do um, sort of operations on, on, on mouths and so on. And they, deal, they can deal with, they, they, they actually sedate people who, who aren't cooperative. We, we, we were recommended to that. So we took her there. The first time we took her there, she refused to cooperate. But they said, don't worry, you know, bring her back like in a week's time. And we made another appointment. And then this time they, they were ready for her. You know, they were prepared. <laughs> so they did the, the operation and, and, and she was OK. There was only local anesthetic, but she didn't feel anything. And they somehow persuaded her to let them do it. And um, so it was lucky that this was done just before she went into the home. But we had to go through this whole rigmarole to, you know, to have this done. I can't remember what the detail of it was, but it was really quite a, an exercise. The process was worse than what needed to be done. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, you asked me at the beginning about differences between the States and in Israel. Well, it might help to know that Israel for many, many, many years was run by a labor government, a, basically a socialist government. So they had very they have very strong laws of protecting workers and so on and so that has helped a lot. But fortunately, Israel opened up and became more of a capitalist society. So now it's more capitalist than that, but still things hang over. Now a few years ago, the gov the Israeli government decided that it would be better for people to stay at home than to be institutionalized passed a law that enables people, as I mentioned earlier, to get caregivers in their home to look after them. And that costs a certain amount of money, of course. And the government, in order to make the system work, um, subsidizes a portion of the cost. So in my case, and I think this is usually the case, when you have a full-time carer, 24-7, they paid 40% of the cost, the government. And now, when she went into the home, of course, the care, we didn't need the carer anymore, but the home, all homes, all, um, uh, what do you call them, uh, residential homes and, 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 and uh, nursing homes and so on, are run by, are controlled, although they're private, they're controlled 
by the Ministry of Health. So there's a maximum price they can charge, which at the moment is 15,000 shekels, which comes to, I believe, $4,200 a month. That's the maximum charge. Which is about the baseline for us. Yes, yes. So, so it, but the, see, of course, look, the, the States is a much more, uh, people earn much more salaries there by a factor of two or three on average for a given job. But also the, 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 these costs are less. So it sort of works out in the end because if people earn less, they pay less, but it's in proportion, it's the, almost the same. But it's definitely more expensive. I know, coming from England, I also know that in England, it's much more expensive. So what 1000 to 4200 a month in England might cost 10000 a month, and in the States might cost 20000 a month or, or something like that. You know, crazy prices. Mom was, she passed away on March 31st, starting April 1st, her rent and care fees would have been a little bit over 7,000. She was at between 56 and 5,700. And yeah. then because she was evaluated every March, so March 2019, she was evaluated and things were still fairly simple and easy. Mm -hmm. And then May, June, all the way till her passing, she just kept getting more difficult and more combative. And then she fell and broke her leg. And when yeah. we brought her back to the residence on March 12th, we just, I, I told the, the director, the memory care director, I said, I know we need to do mom's evaluation. She goes, I have the paperwork right here. And I'm like, oh, shocker. And so we just filled it out. And they were, she was quite generous on if, if there was kind of a question on does mom need a little bit more help or a little bit less help she'd kind of err on the side of a little bit less because it kept the price down a little bit mm -hmm. um but she jumped significantly just because there'd been such a change in the 10 months mm -hmm. so that's you know it's and it's unfortunately cost prohibitive for a lot of people my yes, dad absolutely. had my dad had investments they had their social security oh yeah and then we rented out her home until yeah. I should, I should mention that here, if uh, the, the Ministry of Health, if, you, uh, if your spouse or a member of the family goes into a home, you can apply for a subsidy. So although they limit the price, you can also apply for a subsidy for that price. I applied, but I was turned down because I you know, have earned enough money and I own this house and I own a, an apartment the, our apartment in Natanya. So they said, no, you don't qualify, but that's fine. I, I didn't quarrel with that because the amount is not too much. And by the way, for that amount, this includes all drugs, all medication is included. They, because the doctor is on site and she takes care of all the medication. So I am no longer liable. I don't have to have any responsibility for getting her medication and giving it to her and anything like that. It's all taken care of there. And if the doctor there decides that she needs to see a specialist, they arrange it. They get a van and they take her to the specialist and the specialist sees her, you know. So I don't have to do deal with any of that now. That's that's another very positive aspect of the situation. And we need to shift our our residential care home communities to that i didn't have to worry about mom's medication because it was ordered and shipped online so the whenever they needed more of whatever they would just put an order in through this one company and then it was delivered to mom's residence so mm -hmm. the, I, there was no middle i was not the middleman on that so that right. other so it than was a direct delivery yeah exactly i mean i did pay the bill but it was also a a direct withdrawal from mom's bank account. So I didn't have to worry about that either, mm -hmm. but the, the, the government was not involved in that at all, but the whole, oh, the doctor part, because you know, they would call me and say, well, we think mom's got a UTI. And I learned real fast that that was not what was going on with my mom. Cause I went through four or five appointments with, you know, to getting a urine sample, which was not easy. And, uh, Dry, you know, going yeah. from my house to oh, pick yeah. her up back to the doctor, which was literally a mile, a mile, slightly like three quarters of a mile 
away from my house. So it was like back and forth and back and forth. And she would get agitated. And I don't know if it was because I was concerned about, you know, picking her up and getting her there on time. And I tried to make sure that there was a lot of flexibility because I knew if I was tense, she would get tense and then it would just go all wrong. I've never really did figure out why she was okay with the dentist except for once. But I, maybe she didn't like the new doctor. I don't know what it was, but doctor visits were a nightmare. And it, and I spent parts like a significant amount of February trying to find an in-home concierge doctor service, which they do have here in the States that would come in and take care of her. Unfortunately, those companies function in the big cities, not out here in the suburbs where we're at, oh, I see. Uh-huh. which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because, I mean, it does and it doesn't. The one company that I contacted, I was like, oh, these guys sound great. And they were like, well, you know, check back with us in a few months and see if, if we're servicing your area. And I'm like, it's, we're about 50 miles northeast of San Francisco. So it's like, okay, well, if you're servicing San Francisco in Oakland, it's going to take months and months and months to creep out that 50 miles to get out <laughs> here, you know, because then the next biggest town over is Stockton and that's not the yeah, biggest town. Mile, yeah. So, nice. you know, it's like, we're way out here in the, in the boonies. So mm. I'm like, yeah, I, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to happen for mom because I figured she would be gone before that happened. And little did I know. Yeah. But yeah, but it's just it not having a doctor me, in the community was a nightmare. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, my wife Naomi is much better cared for in this home because she has a doctor on site. She has nurses there. Anything happens, you know, they're they're there if there's a need for a doctor, or if she needs to be to be taken to the hospital, the emergency, or anything like that. They will take care of it. So, you know. And I don't, so luckily I don't have to deal with that. So I found myself with a lot more time. <laughs> so I applied to the local university and I became a visiting professor of chemistry at the local Ben-Gurion University. So I've been, you know, it keeps me occupied. I do things and it's, it's, it's good. It's important because we have to yeah. keep our brains active and yes. learning and doing. Absolutely. You know, the key thing. Although I don't think necessarily doing that will stop you getting Alzheimer's, but it certainly helps you to keep active by being involved in using your brain in doing things. I think that's very important. Is if it slowed it down a year or two, just think you know, it just it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, I mean you know. Especially now, my mom had younger onset Alzheimer's, so it it still would have benefited us because maybe my niece and nephew would have gotten more. My daughter got all the good years with my mom. My niece and my nephew, my nephew's adopted, so um, by the time they adopted him, she was already in the later mid stages. Mm-hmm. And my, I do recall my sister basically telling my telling me she had to tell my niece why her grandmother kept asking the same question over and over again when my niece was like six, which would have made mm-hmm. my daughter 20. So my daughter really benefit. My sister and I are only four and a half years apart. So the fact that the kids are so far apart is kind of interesting. Yeah. But- I should, I should, I should mention that my daughter, Miriam, whose um, surname is green, Miriam green. Uh, she has a, a blog, uh, which she writes about, uh, her mother about my my wife. It's called um, the Lost Kitchen. I like that title. It, it comes from the from the something that a doctor told me once. He said, if you go into the kitchen and you don't remember what you went in there for, that's not Alzheimer's. If you go into the kitchen and you can't remember what a kitchen is, that's Alzheimer's. So that's why she called it the Lost Kitchen. I always heard the same analogy with car keys. If you can't remember where you put the car keys, that's just forgetfulness. If you forget yeah. what they're for, that's a problem. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So do you have any last tidbit of advice before I let you go? Because I know it's getting really late in Israel. It's not even it's, lunchtime here it, in California. No, it's, nine, it's nine o'clock. It's not so bad. Okay. Uh, I went the wrong direction uh, on the timing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's later than earlier, right? 
Um, well, I was thinking it. Well, I I didn't. I added twelve hours, not ten. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so um, I I don't really know what to say, except that you have to accept the situation. Accepting the situation is the hardest thing, especially at the beginning. And once you accept the situation that you are in this situation. That, you know, there's no point in complaining that, you know, I didn't sign up for this and, you know, this is not my wife anymore, my husband, you know, this is, you have a responsibility and you have to look after this person and do, do whatever you can. And when it comes to it, you have to be also prepared to break the connection. And sometimes, uh, one thing I would uh, mention is that most of the people involved in discussing caregivers and the situation of, 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 of people with Alzheimer's are women. But actually, the people who get Alzheimer's are more women than men. So it turns out that men are more the caregivers, in mm -hmm. a sense. But they, we have very little voice in terms of the general discussion of the situation because men, let's face it, tend not to be so... Um, forward in, in discussing personal or private things. So maybe because I'm a, I'd like to write and I write, so I did this, but I think it's more of an exception because most of the books that, for example, our authors have listed, most of them are by women. That is true. Uh, so, you know, anyway, the thing is that as a man, it was very difficult for me to adjust as it were, to, to having a wife, but being single again. You know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a complicated situation. But I think uh, overall, although it's a tragedy, you know, we've dealt with it. Many people, unfortunately, have tragedies in their lives, and we, we've tried to deal with it, and hopefully we've, we've dealt with it as best we can. Well, that sounds terrific. I appreciate the stories and the advice. And I will look up Miriam's blog because that sounds terrific. And yeah, she she's also written a book, by the way, which was published by a publisher in Oregon, as far as I remember. And it's also called The Lost Kitchen. And um, just just an anecdote before actually her book and her blog came out of a discussion discussions that I had with her because when my wife got Alzheimer's. And I couldn't cook. And so I was calling my daughter all the time about how, well, what do I do? How do I cook this? How do I do that? And out of that came her book. It has recipes in it as well. So, so uh, it, it produced something useful in the end. Well, there's a lot of us caregivers that seem to turn to finding something. We create something. We write a book. We create an app or podcast. Yeah. Right. I think that's really what I find very interesting about this community is how many yeah. of us create something out of this. Yes, it's like a response, mm -hmm. a, a, a personal and necessary response to the situation we're in. Yeah. Awesome. Anyway. Well, I appreciate it. I will very let nice you go. To you. you too. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. All the very best. Bye-bye then. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.